Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metcalf Institute's occasional webinar series. I am Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf's Executive Director, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed and inclusive public conversations about science and the environment for 25 years as of this year. We approach this goal holistically, offering science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the country to make science communication more inclusive and equitable. Today, I have the great privilege of welcoming two Metcalf Institute alumni as our featured speakers. Jory Lewis, who's joining us from Senegal, um, has a brand new book that was just published called Slaves for Peanuts, a story of conquest, liberation, and a crop that changed history. And that book will be the focal point of today's discussion. And Moises Velasquez Manoff, who will moderate the discussion, is another alum of our environmental reporting fellowships. Both Jory and Moises were in the 2006-2007 class. Um, it's really a pleasure to bring them back to Metcalf Institute, even if virtually, and um, to kind of have this full circle moment. These fellowships, which ran from 2001 to 2010, offered a unique professional development opportunity for early career journalists whose racial and ethnic identities are underrepresented among environmental reporters. The fellowship provided a month of immersive training in environmental science, followed by a nine month environmental reporting placement in a newsroom with which each fellow was carefully matched. Jory, for example, worked with pub the public radio international show, The World, while Moises worked with the Christian Science Monitor. Alumni of this program have gone on to contribute to science and environment reporting in countless ways, winning awards along the way, and we are thrilled to recognize another one of those achievements with you today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the Metcalf Institute donors who make programs like this one possible. And now, I'm thrilled to introduce today's moderator, Moises Velasquez Manoff. Moises was born in New York City, raised in New Mexico, and educated in California. He's a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. His work has also appeared in The Atlantic Monthly, Mother Jones, Scientific American, and Nautilus, among other publications. He holds a Master of Arts with a concentration in science writing from the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. In 2013, Scribner published Moises's first book, Epidemic of Absence, a new way of understanding allergies and autoimmune diseases. And with that, I'm thrilled to hand it over to Moises. Hello, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be back as well. Um, I'm gonna introduce Jory. Uh, Jory Lewis is an award-winning journalist who writes about agriculture and the environment. Her reports have appeared in PRI's The World, Discover Magazine, Pacific Standard, and the Virginia Quarterly Review, among other outlets. In 2018, she received the prestigious Whitting Grant for Creative Nonfiction. Jory is from Springfield, Illinois, home of Abraham Lincoln, not The Simpsons. She has lived in Dakar, Senegal for the past decade. Slaves for Peanuts is her first book. Welcome, Jory. Thank you, Moises. And thank you, uh, Sunshine, also for welcoming us back. I have to say, that it's true. I um, I think that my Metcalf Fellowship really solidified this this um, this trail that I, I came to follow over the rest of my career. So, thank you, thank you, Metcalf uh, Metcalf Foundation, Metcalf Institute. <laughs> did did you do you think there's a, a a trail that leads directly to this book from the Metcalf uh, experience? Um. I don't know if it directly to this book, but I think for sure, I don't know, you know, I got this Metcalf Institute Fellowship just out of journalism school where I did have, I had kind of pursued a concentration, um, you know, I'd done this big project on climate change reporting, you know, I'd written my, um, my thesis about a black farmer in California. So I had a kind of, you know, I was interested in these issues, but you know how things go, like when you have a, a career, if I had gone into like a general public radio station, I might've been, you know, reporting on education now, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that the, this fellowship really helped me sort of stay the path and understand like how I could keep reporting on the environment for sure. Right. 
So that's sort of my, my first question, of course, as someone who's interested in how books originate, you know, book ideas is you, you allude to a little bit in your in your preface of the book, but, you know, seeing peanuts grown for the first time when you were in Senegal and, and knowing that uh, some of your your own ancestors have grown peanuts in the South. Right. Um, so is that is that right? Yeah, I, um, that was my, you know, I, I, I said it was kind of a false memory. I thought that my grandfather or like, you know, his, his brother or something had been growing peanuts, but it was a false memory. It was his father that was, ah. that was growing peanuts, but we were, we were always buying peanuts and we always seemed to have peanuts when we visited Arkansas. So I just thought that we also grew them, but, <laughs> but the, you know, it had been my, my great grandfather who had been a peanut farmer among other things, many, many other things. And so how did this um, come together when, once you're in Senegal as sort of the, the uh, you know, the, the egg of a, of a book idea that then, you know, the seed of a book idea, I should say. Yeah, I think it's, you know, so I, I came to Senegal um, in, in 2011 with a two-year fellowship to, to study sort of food security in the region. And I was interested, um, you know, it was, it was supposed to be the region more generally, like all of West Africa, kind of thinking about ECOWAS or something. But uh, Senegal had a sort of unique um, issue is that it wasn't really producing much agriculturally except for peanuts, right? There, I mean, there were other smaller crops and, uh, and stuff, but, you know, there was this huge emphasis on, or huge reliance on, um, on imported rice and and then just like huge swabs of the country that um, were in peanut production. So I wanted to understand more about how how this happened. Like why had Senegal become this this big peanut growing country? What did it mean for the culture, for the society? I think even before I moved, one of the first books I'd ever read about Senegal even though you know I'd read maybe like you know back in the day things back in at university or something you know work about like negritude and maybe like Sheikh Anta Job or something like that, but what I sort of learned about contemporary Senegal was that there was this really huge enmeshment with like religious groups and peanut production. So it was just like all of those things led me to um, really caring <laughs> and, and and thinking about the the peanut. And it was only kind of by happenstance that the sort of relationship to enslavement sort of started to become, you know, overlaid in my understanding of, of, of peanuts in the region itself. Right. Would you actually tell that story, that anecdote about uh, that you that you talk about in the book about uh, someone who was supposed to be elected, the most competent person that was supposed to be elected to a post, right, in, in, uh, in uh -huh. a village, but they didn't want to elect him because he had... Uh, enslaved ancestors? Sure. Yeah, so I was always spending a lot of time in the main, what they call now the peanut basin, which is in, in the book, you know, the, the region is called Kajor, but that's moved over time. Uh, and it, it, it is now a region called the Saloum. Uh, and I was always spending a lot of time in that, that region, kind of, um, you know, visiting various like different peanut farmers and peanut collectives and other because I was also interested in like people who are moving away from peanuts. So anyway, this particular village was organizing themselves into a um, like a farmers collective to grow uh, to grow vegetables right instead of peanuts to grow vegetables off season for like market gardening to to sell. Uh, and the person who you know I thought should have been, and many other people the, thought should have been uh, the president of this associa association was sort of um, pushed aside because it was, it was said he was descended from enslaved people, right? And so that was the first kind of, you know, click for me, I think, in thinking about, thinking about this, this issue in general. And then I, I, I was later just sort of doing reading and discovered there were any number of villages in the Saloum of enslaved people, like not currently enslaved people, but of descendants of enslaved people. And I, I was trying to also kind of wrap my mind around what that meant. And that kind of took me on a, on a, a large journey. Yeah, I was wondering if you would actually contextualize for us uh, the issue of slavery in, in Africa 
pre-colonial contact, how, what, how it was treated and imagined as an institution, and then how it changed once the Portuguese and then the French arrived? Yeah, you know, um, right. So I always like to say that uh, slavery in the New World and also in Africa and many other places had a kind of range of presentations. And we have a tendency uh, now to think that the American experience of, of, of enslavement is singular, is the only one. Uh, but it's, you know, it's almost like an outlier in terms of systems of slavery, right? So um, in America, we had mostly this sort of chattel slavery. Um, although even within chattel slavery, there are a range of presentations of it, right? So there are these kind of huge plantation slavery, there's like, you know, smallholders with just a couple of slaves where there might have been more intimacy in the family in, in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of their their working relationships. So maybe maybe even work the fields with the master or whatever. Right. So I think that there's a similar range in West Africa, which is the only one I can speak of. I cannot speak of the entire entirety of Africa which is a huge right, continent. Right. Um, but um, in West Africa, there, there, there had always been a range. And this particular part of West Africa, there are societies, many societies, which are extremely hierarchical. So that enslavement um, is a, a category <laughs> that, that already existed. Slaves uh, or enslaved people were sort of created by, mostly by war. Uh, they would go to war with a, another kingdom or another place, you know, a place of foreigners and then take captives of war. Uh, and then those captives of war could be traded, but then there were, there was this other category of people who were kind of born slaves, but the, those people were typically not, um, not traded, were not sold again. And over time, those people kind of uh, sort of folded into the society in a kind of, had a place, um, sort of derived a sort of kinship. So, you know, that's, that's basically how, you know, we think it was and how it presented. I think that when the transatlantic slave trade um, started, you know, in the, in the 15th century, essentially, uh, the, uh, this increased exponentially the demand for enslaved people, right? So you can imagine uh, like the mechanisms that were there to create, to create enslaved people. So like war, imprisonment, you know, calling people like witches and sorcerers or, you know, criminals of various kinds, those also increased, right? Mm. So that the transatlantic slave trade um, uh, both increased the quantity of enslaved people. And then in some cases also uh, changed how that enslavement was lived even inside of Africa. And, and it made it more, more like chattel slavery or? or... Well, not, not always, but so like maybe in some places where there wasn't much slavery, for example, like there could be, so because of the transit link, there, there are a few scholars have done a lot of work on this. Um, there are a few places, especially in coastal areas, where maybe there wasn't a huge amount of, of, of enslavement of like foreign people. So there maybe had been like the slave category of people who were kind of this like lower caste of servitude. But there wasn't so much like trade slave happening, right? <laughs> you know, but uh, because of the transatlantic slave trade and kind of the need even for um, staple food, foods for for slave ships for <laughs> forts on the coast, which, you know, now had like hundreds of people, like foreigners um, to provision in those places occasionally and in some areas along the coast even developed the kind of um, agricultural economy to provide those provisions. And in, in cases those the, that agricultural economy was, you know, using enslaved people themselves. So there, there are any number of shifts that kind of happen. Right. So that brings me to this sort of the um, one of the most fascinating parts of your book was the revelation that what what drove the the uh, the demand for peanuts from West Africa was was soap a demand for soap in Europe right or in France in particular right um, yeah yeah absolutely I mean so the demand for soap is it's sort of one of many I do focus a lot more on the soap it's true but the oil um, so like at the beginning of the 
uh, 19th century. I mean, there are two movements that are happening, right? So like at the same time, there's the industrial revolution and there are all these things that are happening. There are like increased, um, increased numbers of machines that need like oil to, to like grease their gears or, or right. whatever. Um, so people need oil for that. But then, yeah, there's this also kind of like hygiene revolution and there's more bathing. But I forget the other secondary use of soap is not actually about hygiene. It's, it's still related to this industrial revolution to like textile manufacturing oh. because they needed soap to wash the, you know, to wash the cloths or. Right. To wash the wool, I imagine. Yeah, 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 exactly. Watch because it has like natural greases in it. Right. So they're they're all together, you know. So I think I mean the, the eventually the peanut has multiple kind of silos it fits into. It's like a cooking oil, and like that's getting like the top price, and then it's like oil for soap, and then oil for lighting and other purposes, you know. Right. I mean, it's so interesting because now there's this there's conflict in Ukraine, and and there's so many pundits out there saying, well, the world is so interconnected now that we can't have a war somewhere without affecting everyone. But this is, you know, this was happening 200 years ago where demand in Europe would, would totally change or, or at least partly change how people live their lives in places as far away as, as West Africa, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the most interesting parts of the book too, is you can see even in the records like this, this dip when the Suez Canal opens and now there are all these like you know, so there were actually a lot of peanuts being grown in India and mm. the French had a colony, Pondicherry. And so they're like, they're importing all this, these, these sort of, they're bad peanuts. They call them junk peanuts from India. And also they come from further away. So they, they tend to be a little damaged, you know, moldy. Like right. when you get them. So, um, and then suddenly like the price in, in, in Senegal that just, it drops, right? So you can already see this kind of global economy kind of interconnected, you know? Right. You and so, that. and and the, the other aspect, which was fascinating is this sort of, I guess you would call it the hypocrisy of, of uh, French governance, right? Where they had abolished slavery in France and in uh, French territories, right? If, if that's ter that terminology is correct, but they seemed like they sort of still needed local African farmers to have slaves because it helped them with their peanuts that they wanted. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too. I mean, even as early as the 1840s, when there, I think I, I use this in the book, there is this particular uh, commandant who later becomes the governor of Senegal who goes to uh, this area they call the Southern Rivers and uh, where there's a brisk that's the only place where you will, would have found these like plantations of peanuts. And then there, this, there's this kind of rascally group of, of, they're like slave traffickers. They're still engaging in a transatlantic trade even though it's outlawed. Uh, so an illegal transatlantic trade at this period. And, you know, he's quite, uh, he admires their ingenuity in a way, instead of saying like, wow, these, these illegal slave tracker, traffickers, he just sees the fact that, um, well, he maybe he believes that they're not trafficking or something, I'm not sure exactly, but he sees that they're using enslaved labor to grow peanuts and he thinks that's a great thing. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit strange, right? Because he's actually also yeah. an, an abolitionist himself. So there is this, from the beginning, this idea, and, and you know, it's coupled with a bunch of kind of like racist ideas about, um, about the nature of work and how, you know, maybe that Africans can be um, elevated <laughs> by working. And so there, there's this is whole kind of um, basket of, of, of weird racist, racist rhetoric kind of that they use to justify um, kind of looking the other way, but also um, using this, the kind of like economic logic of the peanut peanut market to turn a blind eye to the enslavement that's happening, even though even though it um, goes against their own stated values. Right. What, so would peanuts have been profitable if they were if slave labor was not available? If everyone was freed and had to be paid, all the laborers? Yeah, I mean, I think probably because it, that's what happens later, right? Like, yeah, like, right. I think that's part of the arc of the book, right, is that you see that that peanuts kind of also allow, um, you know, subjugated people, people in various levels of unfree labor, right? So sometimes it's 
it's full on enslavement. Sometimes it's a form of sharecropping. Sometimes there's like debt peonage, right? And this allows them this allows uh, them to um, to buy their own freedom and like have a means to to support have them a means. in a in a place that uh, you know maybe would have been more difficult. Right. That maybe right. would have been more difficult. Period. We're, we're getting audio from someone else. Yeah, that was tripping me up for a second. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an but epidemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so the, the peanut in a way is also like um, an object of freedom. It's like a, a, a yeah. thing that, that, um, that, 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 that helps people gain their freedom. So like, I'm not, you know, it's funny, someone I think on Twitter, which is of course the worst place, but um said, oh, you know, this book is going to make me feel bad about eating peanuts. And that's not actually, you know, I didn't write out, set out to write right. a book that's like anti-peanut. I love peanuts, you know. Um, <laughs> so I didn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I feel guilt about buying peanuts. No, but the, the history is complicated that the peanut, right, had, right. the peanut is an object. It is a plant, you know, and it had a role in history that was both uh, good and bad. And I think that's, that's, um, that's what history is all about sometimes. And I think we have to have a we have to have a more robust and complex ability to understand the 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 pluses and minuses and sometimes the things that we don't know are pluses and minuses in history. And I think that's yeah. That's really that comes across in the book. And, and it's actually it relates to this question I have about religion and the role it plays as well. Um as a potential as both like you could see it as a tool of, of colonial oppression. Uh, that is, I'm thinking of Christianity, um, but it also seems to serve as a vehicle for liberation, right? The, at least uh, the, the, your main character, one of the characters you follow throughout the book, Walter Taylor, um, he's getting funds from, from France to help, uh, you know, be newly freed people in, in uh, St. Louis. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, sort of that, that how religion, and also that you mentioned this sort of tale of Exodus as being very important and people thinking about how they were they were, could be liberated um mm. the dual role of religion yeah Christianity, uh, yeah well yeah so i mean so I'll, I'll let me just introduce the this character walter taylor who i personally was you know i became sort of enamored with him as a character i think i i found out about walter taylor just through like a small phrase and in, in a book that mentioned this sort of Protestant missionary from Sierra Leone. And I was like, well, I didn't know, number one, that there were Protestants because, you know, it's a French colony, right? You know? And then number two, I didn't know that there were like black missionaries in 1870s, you know? So this, uh, this all kind of just blew my mind and I wanted to learn more about his, his, um, his route from Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone to, to San Luis. Uh, so Walter Taylor was um, was a, what they call a liberated African. He his parents had been freed from a slave ship and resettled in the villages around Freetown. That was one sort of category of of what are now kind of people who call themselves Creole, but like one one portion of the Creole were these liberated Africans who have like a slightly different trajectory. Uh, um, and yeah, and many of them at that time, and Walter Taylor himself was Yoruba. Uh, so he grows up in a community of, of people with similar experiences, people who had been enslaved. And, you know, we don't know much. We don't know anything about the, um, the conditions of his parents. So like some people might have been enslaved for years inside Africa before embarking on the slave ship. And some people, their, their trip to the slave ship might have been relatively short. So who knows like what their own experiences had been. But nonetheless, like they they kind of shared an experience of, of like enslavement, of bondage and liberation. And, and this kind of also shared experience of trauma and language and religion. So they, he grew up in this community, I think, where he could kind of understand probably what the sort of force and strength of this kind of unification of this, this group of people might have been. So later in life, you know, uh, in his early 20s, Walter Taylor 
um, goes to to Senegal. He, he originally goes because he's um, he's an accountant and he works at a he works for a Boston uh, shipmaster who's uh, who is exporting peanuts from from the west coast of Africa to to like New York and Boston and, and New Haven and all these places, right? And then later he becomes a Protestant missionary. He, he joins the Protestant mission uh, because he feels like he has a calling to help people. He, he, he even mentions explicitly sort of being on the island of Gore, which is just, just off of um, the coast of Dakar uh, and is well known as a kind of stopping point for, you know, had been um, a sort of stopping off point for slave ships, that kind of thing. Although it's never particularly important to the slave trade, but it's another story. Um, but but it was an island where there had traditionally been many enslaved people. And then after the end of slavery, um, I mentioned in, in the book, the, the sort of status of people, the status of enslaved and free, that changed, but their condition didn't materially change. Um, so that people were still working the same jobs. I, I, I think there's a quote in the book where someone says they have the same measure of freedom that they always had. So that, that Walter Taylor says he's, he's saddened by the condition of, of, these, of these workers who, who are presumably formerly enslaved and probably making a comparison to his own upbringing, which was, which was different, right? And so he... Um, you know, he, he, he feels, and he has some kind of Christian conversion also at some point, and he feels like that this is, it's possible to create a better kind of community for, for people who have been, for newly liberated people, essentially. I went off on a ramble on that one. I'm not trying no, to I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and, and he goes to France to make the case. I mean, it's like a remarkable story. It's like this is going to be made that that part of the book, I'm sure, will be the part that's made into a movie about this this character. Right. That's what would, yeah, would be lovely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can see why you became enamored of him. It's um, I have actually two questions here from the audience that are related mm -hmm. on on your research, um, how you piece this history together whether you found yourself having to dig into unconventional archives or methods and challenge your own approach to historical research. Could you share more about how you navigated this? Uh, yeah, I, I spent, so, well, I mean, there are a few aspects of this. So originally Walter Taylor was not in the book. <laughs> really? Characters. No, yeah, I had other characters in the book, but I didn't have, so my goal in writing this book too, like I'm not a historian, right? I'm a journalist. I have like a degree in anthropology, but not a doctorate. Like I, have, like, you know, I have, you know, I'm a journalist, right? So I wanted to write a narrative. I wanted it to be gripping and interesting. I wanted to get as much into the voices of, of the archive as possible. And the initial characters that I, that I had chosen, the, the depth of, of, um, of archival information was too shallow. I didn't have enough to fully create that narrative. And yeah, so once I found this little note re referencing this like Protestant missionary from Sierra Leone, I, I, I think I was reading some other book and I realized that there was correspondence. There was correspondence that this other, it's very strange, like not strange, with a sort of French, big French volume about the Protestant missions activities throughout the world. And I realized that he was quoting from letters, like personal letters. So I decided, I was like, you know, let me go check out these archives in France and see. And I found that there were 20 years of correspondence yeah. with, with Walter Taylor, with the director of the mission. And that really did become part, you know, like the basis of the Walter Taylor story. Otherwise, like the, the lat drawer story, the story of Cajor, that is also based on, you know, the really very, um, not super well kept, but like very important Senegalese national archives, which have this reams. I mean, it's hard to even characterize like how much correspondence they have from, from, from local leaders, from, from, from religious leaders to like kings and there are secret, you know, private archives that you might find in France that are just like the correspondence between like a commandant and the general or, or the minister. And like, so it's really interesting to kind of like triangulate all that information, some of which was private, some of which was public, some of which, you know, there's a lot of sort of backstabbing in the archives. 
So those those were my two main sources. But after that, I did I did use archives in Portugal and Sierra Leone and Gambia, um, in the United States, obviously the the Bostonian archives, the Bostonian Society's archives. Uh, the Sierra Leone was it had um, a lot of schools that were administered by this this thing called the Christian Mission Society that's a part of the Anglican Church. So I used those archives. Um, and then, yeah, I also used a number of, um, what do you call like um, oral histories, uh, but that had been written, right? So like written in Wolf typically and with French side by side. And then using kind of uh, all the vast quantity of like tales and fables and just everything, to be honest, I could, I could, yeah. I could use. I just used literally everything I could find. How long were you working on this project? So long. So, 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 long. so, 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 so long. I don't, I think in my mind refuses to put a number. I, th I think I was working on it. Um, I think I got the contract in 2015, but don't quote me on that. I don't know. I, don't, like, I think I pushed it to the back of my mind. I think it must have been 2015 that I got the contract. Yeah. Yeah. And you probably so, already done significant research before that, right? Just I had done some, yeah, I had done, yeah, a fair amount of research before that, but it changed. So actually, right when I got my contract, the Senegalese National Archives closed and they closed, they were, they were moving and they were supposed to be closed for six months, but they were closed for like 20. So I think during that period too, I kind of reshaped, that's when Walter Keeler emerged, that's when all these other things kind of started to move. So I had, uh, yeah, even though I'd done a fair amount of research to begin with, uh, I think that it just, yeah, it, it was like started over, you know? Right. So here's a question from a listener, uh, Rick Rhodes. Jory, many thanks for the presentation. As you did your research, did you have a eureka moment? And if so, what was it? My eureka moment? I don't know if I had a eureka moment. I mean, I talked a little bit earlier about the moment of, um, you know, sort of just thinking about like, well, how, about how the peanut and the, the and, and sort of enslavement sort of work together. I don't know. I, I have like super nerdy moments sometimes reading the text, especially the especially the work around lat jar because I was using so I was using like the the primary documentation like these let letters, but then like I'm not um, a specialist in some ways, right? So then I was reading like you know also like the epic stories that sort of recount his story because it's really dramatic and it's become kind of like national lore you know uh and then reading like a number of different historians at least like five or six <laughs> historians who've kind of intensively looked at this issue and I would sometimes sort of geek out about like small things that I I, I you know that I thought I was finding, especially about the motivations of Dimba Warsaw and his um, his uh, his machinations. Basically, I will leave you to understand what that means in the book because I don't want to spoil <laughs> it. It's, it's too delightful. <laughs> I, we we spoke about this before we, we uh, everyone came on, but uh, David Barron is asking if there's plans to translate the book into French and to publish it in Senegal. I keep asking that very same question. <laughs> <laughs> and the, yes, the last message I got was be patient. That's what the sub rights manager said. So, like, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I should advocate for myself somewhere, somewhere, like maybe just, but I don't know any French publishers. You do. Hit me up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I wanted to ask about the, um, the declining quality of peanuts over the course of your book. And every time you mention it, you don't tell us why it's happening until sort of the very end, you give one possible reason, which is actually really fascinating, which was, well, actually you explain it. Um, it's sort of like a reverse natural selection away from fitness towards lousiness. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because it was this thing I was, I was finding in, so, one other sort of stream of, of documentation that I was using was like um, like scientific journals of the time, so like uh, geographic societies and, and that kind of stuff. And 
So I was finding sometimes a reference to this sort of degeneration of the peanut and, and then yes, looking at the actual, I sorry, my dog is just <laughs> harassing me, sorry. But um, the, the, um, sometimes like the actual merchants, um, their documentation, they were saying like, oh, we can't take these peanuts from this place anymore. They're just garbage. So I started, I mean, it was a mystery for me for a while too. I was like, well, what is happening to these peanuts? Like, why is this happening? And, you know, and the example of the Southern Rivers is especially striking because like it's the, um, it's the place where they're growing peanuts earlier than anywhere else, or, or growing peanuts on a large scale anywhere uh, earlier than anywhere else on these big plantations. And then by like the 1860s, they're already having this problem. Uh, and then by the 1870s, 80s, like they just, they, they stopped really even exporting their peanuts to, to, to Europe. So I, I didn't know what to make of it. There was, um, there was a lot of mystery in the archive itself. And yeah, it was only in the, in the sort of early 20th century that the, the number of sort of agronomists and this kind of burgeoning colonial agronomy core essentially that the French colony, the French government sort of deployed to its colonies starts to speculate about what it might be. And some of them are like, well, it's because the Africans don't pay attention and they're not growing appropriately or, you know, um, and then you, you know, and then again, there are these kind of weird racist assumptions too. They're like, well, the degeneration of the peanut actually sort of goes hand in hand with their supposed degeneration of the, of, of the African himself, right? Like the, the, yeah. this is like really deep in, inside the, <laughs> the psyche of the, of even, of even scientists, right? Right, right. Um, and then, yeah, you, you realize later that, or I realized later and the, the agronomists presumably realize it too, you know, <laughs> eventually that there's, I think there are a few things going on. There's deforestation uh, because of this expansion of, of the peanut land, you, they, they're cutting down sort of fragile forests in, in relative dry lands. Um, there's the monoculture, so the breakdown of, of a crop rotation system. And yeah, there's this crazy uh, reverse selection that, that basically people are so indebted that they're selling their seed peanuts and getting back just like junk peanuts and that's what they're growing you know so right yeah here's a question from a listener how has this book writing and publishing process changed the way you see yourself oh <laughs> i don't know that's a good question um you know I, I i guess i would have to say like my own um my own like self-definition as like a journalist sort of receded for a while because I was like I wasn't doing any journalism I was just working on this book like I couldn't I couldn't do any anything else but that you know so maybe that that sort of altered how I thought about um yeah myself and my profession I don't know if that's not really an answer but it's what I got <laughs> <laughs> Can you find similarities between Senegal and America's peanut uh, crop growth? Uh, like, for example, uh, I know that the use of peanut as a crop was not initially largely taken advantage of in the South, as opposed to in the use of cotton as a crop. From Amy Reader. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I talk a little bit about the book in the book that um, just in relation to the the bit I was just mentioning before that Walter Taylor worked for this Boston shipmaster was exporting peanuts from Africa and why was because there was this demand for peanuts but there was no supply there the people weren't growing peanuts on any large scale in in um in 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 the south because they had these kind of super negative associations as as a as just a slave crop and uh, there, yeah, so that I guess broader farmers weren't, weren't growing it. So actually I, I mentioned briefly, there was a, a man in Virginia in the 1860s or I think the 1870s who starts trying to commercialize more of the peanut crop. And at the same time, he sort of makes, uh, makes some sort of connections with peanut sellers like in big cities of New York who are mostly Italian, which is interesting because they were like huh. the new immigrants who are also sort of negatively thought of <laughs> in the society, but eventually 
you know, then after that, right, there's the, um, the cotton, uh, the cotton crisis of the late 19th and early 20th century with the, the coming of the bull weevil. Uh, and yeah. that, uh, that actually is what um, I think uh, in, you know, sort of is one of the motors for increased uh, peanut production. So, in, the, yeah. in the American South, yeah. In the American South, that's, right, right. That's my understanding. I think George Washington Carver's in there somewhere, but I can't remember exactly <laughs> where. It might be about the bull weevil, like as the, maybe he suggested it as rotation, but I, don't quote me on that, I don't really know. But so peanuts do, they're a legume, they do enrich the soil in nitrogen, right? Yeah, but of course like no plant can just be grown right. you know, over and over in the same soil, right? Like even if it's enriching, you still have to have a rotation. I think farmers know that now. And they knew that then. That's actually like in Senegal. That's part of my. <laughs> that's part of what I explained that farmers didn't did know already. Maybe because they were already growing other legumes like cowpeas, uh, like this other semi peanut, the bamboo groundnut, this uh, mistaken peanut. Uh, so they they did know how to to treat the peanut. It was just that this. Um, you know, I was thinking earlier, it's just the, the early relationship of, of um, these merchants to uh, who were buying sort of peanuts in West Africa and exporting them to Europe, it's so extractive. They didn't care about yeah. the conditions. They just wanted the stuff. They didn't know, they right. didn't care like, how it was being grown or why, or, you know. Right. Uh, a question from uh, Melinda Hemelgarn. Can you talk about pesticide use in peanut production, both in the U.S. and Senegal? and ag worker protection. Okay. I, that's obviously a more modern issue. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I don't know what the, I mean, you know, so like the, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't have enough to say. I, I know, that it, so in Senegal, there's not a lot of pesticide use for peanut crops, not mm -hmm. for cereals anyway. Uh, there's very little access to, to pesticides uh, and very, little use, although I'm, I'm sure that some people do use it. Uh, in the US, I'm sure it's much more the risk. The, you know, I wrote a few years ago an article about aflatoxin, which is this, this um, type of, uh, it's like a, is aflatoxin, but anyway, it's, it's a toxin that grows in the soil and sometimes contaminates peanuts. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite serious. And so sometimes bugs are one of the vehicles that introduce aflatoxin into the peanut. So that would be huh. one reason to kind of scale up use of pesticides in that case. Um, and I know that for years they've been working on a kind of like GM peanut, you know, like like a, like a, essentially kind of like a BT peanut, but that doesn't, um, you know, can't get, it, it, it's, it's, it hasn't been commercialized. There's kind of no, there, there are many controversies about, that, about, right. about kind of BTP or whatever, you know. So presumably now, I mean, are they still seeing problems with peanuts now? It, you know, a hundred years after this trade relationship with Europe changed. Um, like in other words, have they have they returned to crop rotation and that sort of thing to sort of uh, get away from the uh, the problems they were having? Well, that's a good question. I don't really, well, I know that in some areas of the saloon, for example, which is really where they're still growing a lot of peanuts, um, like in Cajor now, uh, they don't grow very many peanuts. It's not, um, they, they do still grow some. There are a lot of reasons for that, but yeah, they don't grow as much, they don't grow as many peanuts as before. The uh, problem with the saloon is that, and the problem with maybe Senegal in general is that there's, um, it's a small country, mm. size. South Dakota. So that maybe like you're a farmer and you have a lot of land and you can't farm at all this season, you rent it out. Uh, and you might rent it out and not have any control over like how people are using that land. I think it's probably the same often in the United States where people have like large plots of land and they don't really, they can't necessarily control like what's the rotation process. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, all salt, <laughs> you know, but people do probably give a good faith effort trying to rotate like millet in, in peanuts or corn. Corn's also now a thing. <laughs> right, right. Here it has everywhere for, for like, especially for like chicken feed. Right. Uh, from Lam Hun, um, what is one crop base in Africa that you think could be grown and scaled up to alleviate, alleviate food insecurity? 
Well, you know, my own perspective on food security as a subject is that it's not necessarily about the production more than it is about the market, right? Mm. So then you can grow all you want. And if there's no one buying, <laughs> buying what you're growing, like it doesn't matter, right? Uh, you know, I always think about the, um, like in Senegal, there's always been a big push to be self-sufficient rice production. And so they started growing all this rice in the river valley in the north. Um, but people don't buy Senegalese rice. <laughs> like <laughs> most Senegalese people don't like it. They still don't like it. I did a story about this like 10 years ago. And even today, like, you know, I'll go to, you know, like my in-laws house or something and I'm like, oh, did you buy local rice? And they're like, no, we don't, we don't <laughs> want that rice, you know? So, so what do they buy then? Where do they buy the rice from? Oh, so imported, right. So Thai, Thai rice huh. or Indian rice sometimes. Yeah. They just don't, yeah, there, there are many barriers to, to sort of adoption of, you know, particular crops. So I don't think there's like one crop that's going to solve food insecurity because food insecurity is a, is a problem, is an economic problem, not necessarily a production problem. It, does but it take... My point of view. <laughs> I, I'm just fascinated by the Senegalese rice problem. So is it, does it taste different? They say it takes like longer to cook. Oh. Uh, huh. And then they also say, you know, it's supposed to be better for you, like less, like less sugar apparently, but they, um, yeah, they just say it takes longer to cook and they don't like that. So interesting. A mm -hmm. uh, question from an anonymous attendee. It seems like peanuts are used in authentic soups, stews, or marinades. What are some of your favorite African dishes that use it as an ingredient? Well, I mean, yeah, Senegal has a very rich, uh, you know, rich uh, um, heritage of, of peanut use in, 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 in the cuisine. So actually tomorrow I'm going to make mafe, which is a peanut, um, peanut sauce that you would eat over rice. It's like, it's like peanut butter, usually in tomato sauce, and usually you cook it with meat, but I don't eat meat, so making it veg. And um, yeah, it's delicious, right? So it's kind of like a peanut peanut stew. But yeah, I mean, there are peanuts everywhere there. Um, we just, uh, two weeks ago, there was, it was Easter. And on Easter, there's a special, a special dish uh, that's made from peanut butter and baobab powder and <laughs> millet, couscous, and lots of sugar, obviously, clearly and many, many other things it's called in Galach, and it's really delicious. So yeah, there are just, there are so many things. It's peanut, peanut um, like powder. It's like peanut ground peanuts. Yeah, it's like peanut powder that's used in any number of sauces. Um, yeah, there are so many uses of the peanut. You know, I'm, I'm one of those unfortunate people who's allergic to peanuts. Um, could, I, could I survive in Senegal? Like, or would I just be, would it be everywhere? Yeah, are you allergic to the oil or just the peanut? Because, you know, yeah, the oil too. The whole thing, yeah. <laughs> I'd be screwed. Have some issues. So, like, my, my husband doesn't eat peanuts. Uh, and so, like, there's one dish that I really like. It's called cherry and boom. And it's like, so you use this millet couscous, which is really delicious, and you cook it with um, leaves, usually uh, leaves from the moringa tree or, like, sweet potato leaves or it could be cassava leaves, any kind of leaves. And with mixed with, like, the peanut uh, powder. But we've been we've been discussing like maybe doing that with cashews or this other ah, thing called right. um, this other thing called nail, but I can't I don't I actually don't know what it's I don't know the translation. <laughs> you know? So I don't know, I'll let you know. So maybe if you eat cashews, you could get away with it. Sesame, maybe, you know. Cashews, I I, I love cashews. There you go. That's that's the one. Because Senegal also grows cashews quite a lot. Actually. Oh, wow. Um, the anonymous attendee asked a related question. Uh, within Africa, which market with which product and which processing technology can offer opportunities for income growth for farmers and processors? So related to the, uh, well, you, you go ahead and answer. Whew, I, I mean, that's far above my capacity level. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't know. I would say like, uh, when I see people growing so you got to grow something for export and you should transform it, right? So you have to process it. So like people are growing like uh, hot peppers and making it into like hot, hot sauce. Like that seems like it's, you know, that's a, that's doing really well, but just in general, like high value vegetable crops that can be exported to Europe, 
because Europe's like a easy market, even on a boat, it doesn't take very long to get to. That tends to be kind of like the winter agricultural in the agricultural economy, I think. So like melons or like any, yeah. like, like in America, right? Like half the year we're getting, you know, like grapes from Chile or something like, you know, it, it tends to be like that counter season vegetable or whatever that can, that you could grow and uh, get a good price for it as a farmer. Right. Yeah, I wanted to ask, actually, there was uh, one quote from, I think, a French official, I don't remember who it was, uh, in your book, about how uh, part of the plan for the, the, the uh, colony was to, um, I guess, for the territory was to, like, not only get peanuts that, that uh, African farmers were producing, but to also get them hooked on European products, or at least products that traded through Europe, like the rice you mentioned, or... Um, so like to get them as paying customers, in other words. Yeah, um, that's what I, was, I was also shocked when I found yeah. that. I, like, I didn't know they, you know, because you think, right, that this kind of, um, these kinds of systems sort of just evolve, right? And yeah, they right, right. In a way that's beneficial to the person in control. But you don't think like, oh, they, they like had this in their mind. Like they're, they're you know, it goes full on conspiracy theory from there, you know? Well, it's but, like um, predatory capitalism. It's like the home loans that led to the, you know, to the collapse in the United States, you know, in, in, in 07, 08. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really, it, it, it gives you pause, you know, like when you start like thinking about those types of things, for sure. I was really, I was personally extremely surprised when I saw that myself. No. Do you still see like remnants of that? Uh, that? That is that the country is dependent on imports for certain things or that it doesn't need to be? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I like go off on a screed about that, like, you know, fully once a week, you know. Um, <laughs> actually, even just I was just uh, brushing up on like what's new in the what's new in the peanut in, in the peanut world in Senegal today. And I was thinking about how. So like after colonialism, Senegal did have a kind of parastatal oil company and they had a whole system sort of set up to like work with farmers uh, to, to sell to the parastatal oil company, right? But then, uh, you know, the, the sort of, mm, the IMF presumably <laughs> told them to make reforms, they sell off their parastatal and then like the whole system just breaks down. So now it's actually not that easy to buy a peanut oil, for example, in a grocery store. You don't see ah. it that often. I, when I see it, I buy like three bottles because I like it. But um, uh, but the the same companies that sort of started selling that you know their with their history of selling peanut oil now are just like repackagers. So they like repackage. Uh, like canola oil or sunflower oil imported from abroad. And I just, I am horrified <laughs> by that as a person who wants to also, even though whatever, the peanut has a lot of problems, but to support a rural economy, right? Yeah. So yeah. the agricultural economy of people growing peanuts, it would be great if they could also, um, you know, also benefit a local industry, but the industry uh, doesn't exist anymore, hardly, you know, that, wow. that, that you know. Here's an interesting question. Um, if Slaves for Peanuts became a Netflix series, which actors and actresses would you want to play the main characters? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I have, you know, briefly considered this. <laughs> so but you're right. I've, I've always been considering the, um, I've always been considering just mostly the Walter Taylor character. Although I personally think Omar C would be an amazing light door, even though, you know, <laughs> so Omar C who's this famous French actor, uh, maybe you will know him, but anyway, I think he'd be an amazing ledger. He's like a comedic actor, has a little drama. I think he'd be great. Uh, and then for Walter Taylor, I don't, you know, recently I've been thinking about, you know, that guy from Star Wars, John Boyega, I was like, yeah. he'd be great. I like want him. <laughs> he would be great as Walter Taylor. He's dynamic. Yeah. He's about he's the a, right age at the beginning. I'm like, ah, it's great. He's a good choice. I think he's, uh, he's, he, they'd have to make him look more sickly than he usually looks, I think. Later, you know, but I Later. think at the beginning he can be robust, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. He lose a little weight and like pull it off. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> um, are 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 you TF products made with peanut produced in Senegal from Eugene I, Maine? Eugene I don't Maine. Know what that is. I don't know what. what are you yeah, doing? what is RUTF? Anyone know? 
Phenomenal. All right, here's another question. Congratulations, Jory. It's a thrill to see you after 15 years and to celebrate mm -hmm. you in your book. How, when, why did you end up in Senegal? And are you looking ahead to another subject or project? Uh, yeah, so I ended up in Senegal because I got this uh, fellowship <laughs> to, to move to Senegal for two years. And then after two years, I just uh, was too comfy. And I, I didn't, I didn't want to move back. Senegal's an easy country to live in in a lot of ways. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's just a kind of, it's an easy access country, to be honest. And like, you know, had pretty easy like visa laws also. So it made it easy to be a freelancer there. And then when I developed the book project, I just, I, I was obligated to stay even longer uh for the archives and also just to be you know like if I needed something like um I think in the epilogue of the book I go to this place I'm looking for this place called Kerbala and yeah that was just something I was like yeah you know what I want to go look for Kerbala and if I had been abroad it wouldn't have been so easy to to say like let's go look for <laughs> look for this place you know so it helped to just be here to write the book uh but now uh I am here you know more or less like Go back to the U.S. quite regularly, and I don't really have any plan to um, like move back full time to the U.S. or move to another country. So, but and, and I'm still kind of resting. I haven't quite decided what my next project will be. Uh, Michelle Lee from our our class, mm -hmm. our our year at uh, Metcalf says RUTF is the abbreviation for Ready to Use Therapeutic Food a life-saving essential supply that treats severe wasting in children under five years old. Okay, okay, yeah. I guess I have heard of that. There, yeah, there was this uh, peanut-based product they were using in Haiti. Yeah. So, you know, but the uh, my understanding is like the problem with that is the aflatoxin, right? Because so much of ah. the local production, whether it's in Haiti or in a place like Senegal, where I think like that's not uh, as much of an issue, to be honest, but... um uh is that there's pretty high levels of aflatoxin yeah plumply nut that i just saw the person so you could a accidentally end up poisoning the kid that you're trying to treat is what you're saying yeah but it looks like you know they're probably producing it in the united states but i see which again kind of undercuts like local economies a little bit i mean there's all these there are all these problems right right uh michelle says hello michelle mm -hmm. lee from our class yes. so now we're four Four and, of the photos. <laughs> yeah. And we, what's the next project? I guess that'll be the finest. You sort of almost sort of answered no that, idea. but yeah. I have okay. no idea. I want to take a break, maybe. You know, you can imagine. I spent like yeah, a lot of time working on this book. I, I need to like sleep for a while, like you know, <laughs> work on other things that don't uh, have any link to slavery or peanuts. That is that is my true goal. <laughs> So yeah. Um, well, that's a that's a great spot for us to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Jory and Moises, mm -hmm. um, for this great conversation. And congratulations, Jory, on this wonderful new book, which I'll add again for everybody is now available for purchase at your favorite bookstore. So run on out and get that. Um, thanks also to all of you who joined us today and for sharing such a wide range of questions. Um, that really like ran the gamut. Jury, your responses to that very wide range of questions was <laughs> very impressive. Um, and uh, I just want to note also for everyone, if you enjoyed this program and want to support more of Metcalf Institute's work, we hope you'll make a gift today by visiting urifae.org backslash Metcalf. Margaret has just dropped a link in the chat. Um, to make that a little easier for you. I also want to note that uh, we hope you'll save the date for our 25th annual public lecture series to be held June 13th through 17th um, via Zoom. This year's lecture series will focus on the ways climate change is driving flooding across the country, as well as the consequences of these weather hazards and the equitable solutions that are being devised to manage the problems. So we hope to see you then in the meantime, thank you so much again, and congratulations, Jory, and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Nice to see you all. Good to see you.